not fair. It's not fair. You know, I had waited for a long time for my friend to finish his book, To Transform a City. I met Eric Swanson at a conference in Penang, Malaysia, and uh, he had previously written the book Outward Focused Church, and uh, told me that he was working on this one, To Transform a City. And finally, when I got it, I was really excited, I've been waiting and in contact with him, and I started reading, and I read the opening introduction, and I'm reading this, I'm like, Lord, this is so not fair. I was really upset that I had so looked forward to reading this. I'm like, this is not America, God. How can we ever do what they're doing in America here in Hanoi? It's not fair. And so I just kept arguing with God as I was reading this book. You see in the introduction, Eric uh, and his co-author Sam are telling the story about Boulder, Colorado, a city just outside of Denver that was as a university city, a hippie city that had no evangelical church in that city, very resistant to the gospel. And so the pastors had been gathering uh, monthly a couple times to pray for that city. All the uh, area pastors were meeting together to pray for that city. And what could they do for that city? They put out an ad in the newspaper, paid thousands of dollars for a full page ad to launch a church service and uh, very few people showed up. They tried all kinds of meetings with city officials and they tried different things and just it wasn't working. And so at the fourth pastor's meeting, when they were praying for the city of Boulder, finally one man said, I think God spoke to me. He said, it's only two words. God says, love all. And that was it. It was not about reaching Boulder for Christ. It wasn't not about converting Boulder. It wasn't about changing Boulder. It was about loving Boulder City, loving the city. And that is what made all the difference. And so as I was reading, he talks about how the pastors got together and met with the mayor and then asked the mayor, look, here we are as pastors in the region we have a lot of people and we have some financial resources. What can we do as churches to love Boulder City? And so the mayor gave them a list of the top 10 challenges that the city was struggling with. And so the churches, the pastors decided to get, let's start with education. And they started this aftercare program. They started to uh, tutor children. They started to paint schools that needed painting. And then they came back to the mayor and said, done. We've done this. What's next? And that's when I went, not fair. This is Hanoi, God. Don't you know this is not in America? The pastors aren't meeting together to pray for the city. And even if we were meeting together to pray for the city, we have no relationship with city government. Why would the mayor of Hanoi City want to meet with us pastors? What do we have to contribute to the pastor. We're so small here in Hanoi, just a few thousand. We're not very wealthy. Not fair. And so I thought it'd be impossible to do what they did in Boulder here in Hanoi. But yet I bought enough copies of the book and I gave them to all the elders. This was back in 2012. So some of the elders read it and some didn't read it. <laughs> and at our next uh, elders retreat, we just had one uh, this past uh, 36 hours uh, from Friday till Saturday. We had a retreat uh, outside the city. And so we had an elders retreat in May. And of course, Vision Sunday is coming. What are we going to tell the church what we're going to do this coming year? Nobody had any ideas, embarrassingly me, I didn't have any ideas either, and I was starting to worry, what are we going to tell the church? Until Thomas Schmidt, some of you would still remember Thomas, he had read the book, a good German, he was very faithful, and uh, <laughs> as an NGO uh, director, 
you know, he caught the vision and he said, why don't we start Love and Oil? And of course, uh, I'm like, yeah, let's do that. And the other elders who I read the book said, yeah, let's do that. No idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but it just resonated with us. And so that May in 2012, we presented the vision to the church without any details that we were going to launch Love Hanoi. And since then, that's been really resonating with our church or with God's heart for the city. And we just went on an adventure on discovery. What does it mean? What does it look like if we were to unconditionally love Hanoi City without a hidden agenda? Well, actually, soon enough, we discovered that we're not the only people in Hanoi who love Hanoi. In fact, uh, all, most expatriates who come here love Hanoi, and particularly through the Hanoi International Women's Club. They put in a lot of effort to raise funds for charities through their annual bazaar. And since they heard about our Love Hanoi campaign, invited us to have a booth at the bazaar. For the first time, HAF uh, was allowed to have a booth, not as a church, but because we love Hanoi. And so over the past few years, we've been having this booth at the bazaar. And also our band has been playing at the bazaar and wearing Love Hanoi t-shirts. And this is what we promote to the expatriate community and hopefully what we are known for in the expatriate community. But the one thing I thought would be impossible here in Hanoi, God opened the door. It was the same time that year in 2012 that we also were praying about moving the meeting congregation from a hotel into the office building where we're in today, in a DTEC tower. That was just being built and the owner is Christian that invited us to move in there. We're like, we don't know if the government would allow us to, to have a church in an office building. I mean, a hotel is okay and that was fine, but how about an office tower? So we asked uh, the city government and religious affairs. And so because of that, started to meet with them, start to build a relationship. And the book had taught me to ask this question, how can we love Hanoi? We weren't asking for anything else. We weren't asking for permission. We weren't asking for registration. We weren't asking for visas or whatever. We just, when, whenever I would met a government official, first a colonel and then a general, and then later uh, various other officials, and they would ask, how can we help you? I would say, you know, we are foreign Christians here. We're here for a short time, but I'm sorry to say that most foreigners come here so that they can build their career and then move on to another city. I said, we as a church challenge our members, while you're in Hanoi, contribute to society, bless the city, love Hanoi. How can we love Hanoi? What can we do? And most often they wouldn't know how to respond because nobody probably asked that question before. And so over the years, we've been asking this question. In 2014, two years later, uh, the Hanoi Evangelical Church, the Korean church and HIF organized a joint Easter service. And so as you can see on the screen, we had all three languages for all of the songs and it was filled with Vietnamese and Koreans and HAFers attending. But we also had invited the Hanoi police and the security department and religious affairs to attend and they came. So here you see on the picture on the right, uh, Pastor Pham from HCC and then the former chief of police Mr. Nguyen Duc Chung, and then the head of the Vietnamese CIA department, uh, and then various uh, risk affairs office uh, staff. So they came and the chief of police, he loves it. He loved this kind of events. And since Pastor Nelson that year was leaving, he asked, could he visit the chief of police and say, thank you for hosting me. Thank you for letting us worship here. I want to say goodbye. So we, for the first time, met with the chief of police just before Pastor Nelson went, before summer of 2014. And uh, we had by then all kinds of Love Hanoi products that we gave to them. And so they really appreciated that. 
And uh, so this is for the first time that we met uh, with a very high level of a city government. When Pastor John came, we said, can we now visit and introduce <laughs> Pastor John? And so we went back and exchanged gifts and the chief of police toured us around in a brand new theater that was built at the headquarters of the police station. We invited him to join us for our HIF Christmas concert that was held that year. And since this was the first one, we had labeled it Cross-Cultural Christmas Charity Concert. Uh, and we're doing Love Hanoi action, uh, auctions and we were sponsoring a YWAM Orphanage, the one that we are still working with today. And the chief of police came and the head of the CIA came and the religious affairs came and they loved the concert. And they, we were broadcast on TV nationwide as the Love Hanoi Christmas concert. And so the chief of police invited us to come and have a concert at his new theater for Christmas time. And we couldn't call it a Christmas concert, but we called it Welcoming the New Year. And so here you see a choir made up of ex-drug uh, drug addicts uh, who formed a choir and sang uh, praise songs. And here you see in the crowd uh, mixed uh, both police, uh, police uh, officers and uh, Christians all mixed together. And the cadets were singing national songs about Ho Chi Minh and they presented the values of the police department and so if you can read uh, Vietnamese, uh, we can resonate with their values, we can support these with scriptures, we can actually uh, unite together uh, with the police in what they're doing. The Korean church performed their famous drum performance, Nathan, our saxophone player from Brazil, played uh, on that stage. Um, and then Nam Kuk Chum, one of the drug rehab leaders, stood on stage. Uh, I just read his testimony. We have a book that uh, I'm not sure if it's on the table here yet, but we'll be selling uh, his book with his story and many other stories where he tells that he was in and out of prison 14 times. And he caused a lot of havoc. Uh, in fact, he one time took his baby girl, six months old, out on the street in the cold rain and threatened his wife not to give the baby back unless she would give him drugs, uh, money to buy drugs. That's how deep in the pit he was. And he shared his testimony on stage in front of uh, the highest official from the Ministry of Security Police. And he asked forgiveness. And he apologized to them. And then he said how God has changed his life. Powerful, powerful moment. And so there we were all together and the chief of police gave us gifts and now we are standing on stage with uh, the chief of police here next, right next to me and then the Korean pastor and uh, Pastor Mark, president of the Evangelical Church and the uh, various other officials and pastors. Uh, there we are. The following day, the Ministry of Security posts on their website the report of this event. It very much works in their favor to build these relationships uh, especially with also foreign community. And there it says they praise the Protestant Church for their Love Hanoi campaign. <laughs> this is only just over two years after we launched it. Now, little did we know that just a year after that, the chief of police would be appointed the mayor. <laughs> and I realized, wait a minute. We've already met the mayor several times. He's been to our concert. And so here we are, pastors from the Evangelical Church, from House Church, the Drug Rehab, from the Korean Church, meeting with the mayor at that time and blessing him, blessing uh, the officials that are there from the security department and from religious affairs, and just thanking him for his favor and for allowing us to worship in the city. And that was just four years after I read this book and I was so upset with God that this would be impossible in Hanoi. God made possible. And so uh, it's such a great story. And maybe you've heard the story and don't mind telling it again. I want you to tell this story to your friends, 
when you go visit home to others. Because this is a great work that God is doing in the city. And it is my plan to write this into a book uh, next year, hopefully to be available before summer. HIF is our mission to be a light to the nations here in Hanoi and, and beyond. So we just spent two days talking about this as the elders. What does that mean? What does it look like? How does it impact each of our ministries? And so that's why uh, this August we're spending three weeks talking about our mission, that we are a community on mission, that we've been called to disciple all nations, not just people from nationalities, but in fact disciple the whole nation, all of society being transformed, the kingdom going out from the church into the society. And today I want to finish our mini-series by talking about loving our city. What does it mean as HIF to seek and to pray for the peace of Hanoi. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And even as I just tell this story, I'm just again so amazed about what you have done. And this is so beyond my imagination. As I just admit, I thought it was impossible. But you have made it possible. You've opened my eyes and our eyes as a church that we can have this positive relationship with city government and that we can work with them and contribute towards the betterment of this society. This is your heart also. It resonates with your heart. So Lord, I pray that you would again reaffirm that calling and that mission here in us, in all of us, for those who have been here a long time and for those who are new and have just arrived, Lord, that we can know your heart of love for this city and the people of Hanoi, we pray in Jesus' name. You know, I can talk about this for a long time since I'm doing my doctoral thesis on this topic. Um, but I want to keep it short. Because sometimes people ask, where in the Bible does God say we should love the city? What does the Bible actually say about cities? It's not so straight forward, you know, can't quote uh, just an easy verse to remember. But I just want to take time to highlight three cities that are mentioned in Scripture that really demonstrate God's love for any city, for all cities. And the first one is Nineveh. We just finished a whole series on Jonah this summer. So how many of you were here this summer and you heard uh, the sermon series on Jonah? And most of our Wednesday Westlakers, we are gone during the summer. But Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria had just conquered the city of Damascus, with, which was north of Israel. And so here, this huge empire that had destroyed many other nationalities and had integrated those people and dispersed them around their empire now was at the border of north of Israel. It was a real threat. But because of some internal issues, uh, the government of, of uh, Assyria had lost its focus, was focusing inward, and therefore the northern Israel was able to regain control of their northern borders and had defeated them, Damascus and shored up their borders to resist the Assyrian Empire. And the king of North Israel was proud with that victory. And he was boastful. And at that time, many prophets were prophesying that at some point, Israel would be defeated and they would be sent into exile, but they weren't listening. And it was at this time that, that Noah was called to go to the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, to warn them that God is going to destroy them unless he tells them to repent. Now you can realize how reluctant Jonah was. Why would he do that? You know, let, let them be destroyed. Get rid of this threat. And so he went the opposite direction, all the way by boat to Spain. And you know the story, of course, 
They got caught up in the storm, thrown into the sea, caught by the big fish, strewed out on the sand, and again, okay, God, I'll go. And so he finally ends up going to Nineveh. I don't want to retell the whole sermon series this morning, but I just want to emphasize the last verse in Jonah chapter 4, which clarifies why God is doing this. God's reply to Jonah's reluctance and even his anger, so angry he was that he wanted to commit suicide, God says, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. God cared for this city that for for any Jew would have been unimaginable even for Jews today if you would say God loves uh, the cities that Isis is is having their stronghold in uh, that would be very hard to grasp and this was the same God loved the city because it represented so many people why would he let them be destroyed? Why would he not allow them a second chance? And so the story of Jonah is clear proof that God loves even the most despised cities. I learned that growing up that when you know I grew up in a small town two weeks ago I shared a little bit about my story. There was a small farming village on my dead end street were three farms. And so uh, I grew up running around in the fields and jumping creeks and uh, swimming in the canals, you know. And my parents, they're like, uh, don't go to the city. Especially my dad would tell my mom, you know, the city costs money. Because my mom would always go shopping in the city. <laughs> so he'd say, don't go to Delft, the city, you know, it costs money. Uh, but then, especially Amsterdam, and the city of Amsterdam, notorious for the red light district, famous around the world, infamous. You know, that was the Sodom and Gomorrah of, of, of the sexual industry. You know, everything bad happened in that city. Don't go there. Christians shouldn't go there because, you know, it may rub off. And so, so I grew up with that idea. Cities are bad and evil and cost money. <laughs> But God loves the city, and I told you my story. He ended up sending me to Amsterdam, where, where I met and where we married, and, and he turned my heart inside out for the people of the city. Well, the second city I want to talk about is Babylon. And so the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians, and they took over their empire. And so only two centuries later, Babylon was now at the borders of Israel. In fact, the, the northern part of Israel had been taken into exile uh, during the Assyrian Empire, never to return. And now this small province of Judah, this small people centered around the city of Jerusalem was still left behind. And here they were laid under siege by the, by the Babylonians. And after a long siege in 586 B.C., they conquered Jerusalem and burned it down. They killed most of the people and only took a few captives and, and paraded them back to the city of Babylon. It had been foretold by so many prophets. And even uh, Jeremiah, who had prophesied during a whole succession of kings, he was alive during this time when this happened. And he wrote the, the heartbreak that he experienced during this destruction. And when the, the remnant of the, the, the citizens of Jerusalem and of Judah had arrived in Babylon, he, he wrote a letter to them, trying to encourage them. The few people that were left over. He had seen all this murder and destruction and killing. They had eaten their own children. And so Jeremiah writes this letter to them. And he says, settle down. He says, build houses. 
plant vineyards. Marry your children. He says, increase, don't decrease, increase. Because you're going to be there for a while. He says, while you're there also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. And pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, so you too will prosper. Now, this is NIV translation. What is actually says in, in, in Hebrew is also seek the shalom of the city. And shalom, uh, even today, is still used by, by Israelites as a, as a greeting. Shalom, uh, like in Arab, you know, they say, a peace be unto you. It means peace, but it's not just peace that is an absence of war or absence of conflict, but it's a peace that, that is a whole. It's a peace that contains all of life. It's, a, it's about wealth, it's about prosperity, it's about health, it's about happiness, it's about family life, it a, it's a, contains everything in life, in your relationships, within the family and with friends, with people around you. Shalom encompasses everything. And here Jeremiah is saying, seek the shalom of, of the city of Babylon. Pray for the shalom of the city of Babylon. Because as it, here it repeats the same word, as it experiences shalom, so you also will experience shalom. Now, now we can relate to this. We can understand this a little bit more because we are foreigners in a strange land. And uh, whether you think your boss recruited you uh, or you came here on your own accord, in fact, God has plucked you here. But as an international congregation here in the city, over the 20 years that, that we've been here, we can say that as the city has prospered, so HF has prospered. As the city has developed, so HF has developed. And so we can see that as the city grows, it directly impacts us as a church. And this is what Jeremiah was saying to the people of Israel exiled in Babylon, that as you seek the welfare of the city of Babylon, you will benefit from that welfare as well. In fact, it was almost like, you know, you really, I don't want to use a strong word that would raise your hairs, but you really messed it up in Jerusalem. You totally missed it. You didn't seek the shalom of Jerusalem. Blood was on your hands. You're praising me with your lips, but you're doing evil with your hands. And so now I'm sending you over to Babylon. Go practice over there. And then by the time when you come back, we're going to build a new Jerusalem, and we will seek the shalom of this new Jerusalem. That was the idea. Sadly, by the time Jesus came, four centuries later, you know, the city had been built up, the temple had been built, and King Herod had even expanded the temple with brand new buildings, and it had just been completed when the disciples said to Jesus, look at these magnificent buildings. Jesus was not impressed. And so at the end of Jesus' three-year ministry, when he had traveled all over the country preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he came to the city of Jerusalem, he was riding on this cold, referencing back to the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would enter this city like the King of David. So all the people were shouting and praising and cheering, Hosanna to the King of David, the Messiah has come, everybody excited, the children were even screaming, and Jesus, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Two times it says Jesus wept, and one time he he wept over a city. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you 
this shalom, this peace, this wholeness in your relationship with God, with each other, in your wealth and in your health, in your, with your children, your family. If you had only known what had brought you this wholeness of life, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Four centuries, the people of, of Israel had had the chance. So many prophets had come and, and gone. You know, the Sadducees were politically compromised. And the Pharisees were religiously legalistic. And the zealots had become violently rebellious. They were completely missing everything that God had intended for them to be. Jesus wept. He knew it would only be 40 more years before every stone of the temple grounds would be turned upside down. The building would be burned. The gold would be scraped off the walls. Every person would be killed and only the Christians were to escape because Jesus told them, if you see these things happening, run, run. Jesus loved the city. God loves the city. It's not about politics, it's, it's not about religion, it's not about peace from warfare, it's about shalom, and it's about relationship with God, it's about our faith and our hope and our love that we have for God and for one another. That is God's heart for the city, any city. If God loves Nineveh, if he loved Babylon, if he so loved Jerusalem, he loves Hanoi. So what do you love about Hanoi? Now we're a Westlakers. What do you love about Hanoi? Saw Sarah posting a picture of a sunset over Westlake. You love less Westlake? I think it's one of the greatest natural features of this city. What do you love about Hanoi? Food. Food? What do you love? The Hanoians? What else do you love about the city? You know, in many cities you can buy a shirt, I, heart, and then the city name. But really when when we when we when we say that, when we wear that, that means what the city does for me, what makes me feel good about the city. But really, we need to turn the question around. It's not what the city does for me, make me feel good. It's what can we do for the city to make it better. And so here's this question, how do we love annoy that we've been asking for so many years, and we're still asking the same question. One of the early lessons that I learned uh, through the process of the story that I just told, that first and foremost is all about our posture. And it required me to have a change of mind, to be transformed in my thinking, and to change my posture, to be open-handed, to be open-hearted when I meet with the various government officials. Then, Yes, God brought me to this city, as He brought you to this city, but it's, it's not enough just to come to the city. And yes, we came here to do orphanage work, and we came here to do things for the people of the city, but it's not enough just to do things for the people of the city. And so, yeah, we have been living here in Hanoi, and we are a church in the city, but it was a very transformational paradigm shift to stop thinking we're just a church in the city to thinking we are a city church. We're not just so happen to be in the city, but God has placed us in this city to be here to work for the city and work with 
the suit. And so this posture has really changed the relationship and built that relationship that we have now today, not only with government, but with the churches around us here in the city, that we are working together with the churches, with the city. And so how do we love Hanoi? And last week uh, you got handed out the City Partners newsletter, and so this is our main ministry uh, that organizes various opportunities for us to to serve in the city. So there's uh, various uh, opportunities to partner with different organizations that are already here. And so last year when we did the Love Hanoi uh, sermon series, we showed this map and said what we want to do is love our neighbors here in the Westlake area. So who lives here in a one kilometer, two kilometer, five kilometer radius? And how can we express the love of Christ in practical ways in our neighborhood? And so we found out that we have various partners, even in this five kilometer radius, Cross Point Counseling Center that we founded together with uh, Russell Fryer as, an, as a way to minister to real felt needs of expatriate families and national families. And so today we have two counselors that are working there, Russell and Rihanna, Michael's uh, wife, works there. And we need another counselor to come alongside of them because uh, there is a demand for these services where we can truly serve real felt needs of families in our community. And then humanity, uh, humanitarian aid for the children of Vietnam uh, is just around the corner. They have a house for girls and we introduced them last year. And I don't know if anybody's volunteering with them, but you can volunteer with them. Blue Dragon, a very effective organization rescuing children off the streets and out of trafficking. Uh, they have a project also here uh, along the Long Bien Bridge. Many street children sleep on the pillars of the Long Bien Bridge at night. And then UN Habitat has a project with a few houseboats on the river that are migrant workers who do not have a legal status in their in the city so their children cannot go to school and so they have a program to help these families and we can also work with them and then you might enjoy a cup of joma coffee uh, at tong up one but did you know that quite a number of their staff were women who have been rehabilitated from uh, being trafficked into sex slavery and Quilson Arts on the south side of the lake, uh, Linda McAuliffe works with Quilson Arts. And this is a great opportunity to work and volunteer with them, with the deaf who are making handicraft, handicraft products and sell them to uh, various uh, markets here in the city. Uh, no, <laughs> five colors is Linda McAuliffe. <laughs> Quilson Arts is next to Joma and is run by uh, Kester and Koyang. Koyang uh, uh, is at the meeting congregation. These are just in our five kilometer radius and we can partner with any of these. So if you are interested in being active in our own neighborhood, we can partner with them. And please do see me or see Michael and talk to us. You can see Natalia, Natalia, raise your hand. Natalia is on the city partners committee as well. And uh, so you can talk to us. Because we want to love our neighbors. That's what it means. But we have some other practical ideas for getting involved in the city, and I want to just ask Ryan to come up and share a little testimony about what happened yesterday. Yes. The mic on. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so yesterday, um, we had the privilege to join Keep Noi Clean, an organization that goes to different parks and areas in the city to clean Hanoi, and I'm excited to share with you what God is doing right now currently and sharing these stories with you. Um, so it was a beautiful day and God did so many beautiful things, and one of the beautiful things was the collaboration at the front of planning this. So this is a joint effort from Keep Hanoi Clean, uh, their organization, and Love in Action building up to the Love Hanoi Festival with the Youth Committee. 
and with our youth from HIF. And so we were planning this, wanted to, it, it was actually a goal for six months ago for the youth committee to clean Hanoi as an act of love. And through our connection, this would not happen without Keep Hanoi Clean. It has been an organization for two years or so cleaning. We connected with them last year. The youth went last February. And without them, we wouldn't have the connections with the government to get the permits to clean the areas. We wouldn't have the connections with the trash services to take the trash away and out and have all the equipment and the wisdom on how to facilitate this well. And secondly, it was a beautiful day. So we were planning this and collaborating and writing messages back and forth. And the whole week it was raining and then Friday it was just a downpour in the afternoon and raining. And we were so excited. There was this buzz of excitement and anticipation for this to join together. And then it started raining and the anticipation kind of started turning a little towards being worried if it starts raining we're gonna to have to cancel this event. And so uh, we were riding back and forth and we were looking at the weather forecast late on Friday night for Saturday morning. And it was supposed to rain, 60 and then 80% is supposed to rain. And so we're messaging back and forth and our response is, let's pray. And then we're working with uh, the youth committee and Tim, their leader says, let's pray. And so, so we're praying, and then I wake up early Saturday morning, because I'll have to let the kids know if it's canceled or not. And I wake up, my alarm goes off, my eyes shoot open, and I look out the window, and sun is just beaming through. And I'm like, thank you, God. And my, my hands just go, <laughs> I'm like laying in bed, and I'm like, this sort up. And so that is a huge answer to prayer. So look at it, there's blue sky, it is beautiful. It was beautiful seeing the youth serve joining together. Here's some pictures. Um, on the far right, there's uh, Tim, who is leading the Vietnamese youth. Um, and on the far left, there's some of our youth in the pictures. So we're teaming together, and it's just beautiful for me to see our youth active and involved in this. And here's six of the eight youth that went. Um, and that was a huge answer to prayer. So uh, we planned this, and we only had a week to advertise for it. And uh, so all the way up until Thursday, we only had one person signed up to do it, and that was me. Um, <laughs> and so then we had uh, another youth, and then there was a volleyball clinic on Saturday that a lot of the youth that were going to come said they couldn't because of that. And then they found out that that wasn't until 12.30 so that they could come in the morning. So a huge praise request. Uh, answered there, uh, just picking up trash, having a fun time. It was a beautiful day. We, I had beautiful conversations with people that this is what we want from the Love Hanoi. We were serving, and I would have conversations with some Vietnamese, little English, and saying, what do you do? And I teach these youth. I teach the Bible. My dad's a pastor, uh, and we, we love Hanoi and love the earth. And he said, wow, you must be really blessed and just having these little conversations. I had a conversation with an Australian man named Bruce, and he uh, comes and cleans all the time. And so we were cleaning with him and having conversations, and we, we were talking about cultures, the Western culture, Vietnamese culture, and that, you know, the most important thing anywhere you go is people. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's why we're doing this. We, we, we believe God made everything, and we want to take care of it. And the most important thing that God makes is people. And um, so this is our group picture at the end. We have 45 people. And I believe that last Friday we did a study with youth of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this little boy comes up with just a little bit. What he has, two fish and five loaves of bread. And he gives it to Jesus. And what does Jesus do with it? He multiplies it like crazy. He's everyone. It's not just enough. It's more than enough. And I believe that that is what God wants to do with us in this city this year from here on out. That, that we can come forward and give Jesus love for the city. And that he will multiply it a hundredfold, a thousandfold, a billionfold. And that through little things, little things, just picking up trash is a small act. But through that, that God 
and do huge things through that. And that's what God did um, just yesterday. And we're dreaming big. We're, we're already collaborating and working together to do a bigger event. We want to get 150 people together on one day to clean uh, a huge area. And so um, God is working right now and, and multiplying the love we have for the city. Um, and I'm just so proud of the youth for joining and uh, excited for what God will continue to do. Such an answer to prayer I've been relating to the organizers of Keep Hanoi Clean, and so when we were planning on canceling it, I said, we're going to pray. And at the end, uh, from Keep Hanoi Clean, they said, yeah, we prayed too. So, you know, it's just small things that can transform people's lives. And, and one thing that we're working on is organizing a blood drive uh, at the DTAC Tower with the churches in the area. Uh, together so that we can donate blood and we know that Bernard Liu who we just prayed for needed blood transfusion here at the hospital and uh, people said can we donate our blood and they said no we cannot do that but uh, we can do this blood drive together with the local churches that we will be uh, organizing in the near future hopefully this coming month but there are lots of ways to get involved and particularly during this season of preparing for the Love and North and so I just want to encourage you Again, there's a various opportunities for you to participate in loving Hanoi with uh, word and with deed. At the end, really, it's about joining hands for the benefit of the sec uh, for the benefit of the city, cross sector. So you might be thinking, well, what can I do? I'm just an engineer, or what can I do? I'm just a teacher, or what can I do? You know, but when we work together, we can actually do a lot. When an engineer and when a, a nurse and when a teacher joins together, you get a variety of skills that can accomplish a lot of things. But I want to come back to what I said last week. That, you know, we can do these kind of projects and we can volunteer and maybe twice a year you do something like this. Maybe once a month you can do something like this. But there's also something you can do every day. And that's just being Christ-like in your workplace. This is where we shine the light of Christ every day to the people around us. And I just want to finish off with, with a story, a testimony, uh, before I end. But after we end the service, what we will do today is have you meet each other in your domains so that you can know who else is here as a teacher, who else here is in business, who else here is in government, and what could we do together maybe to do something to love Hanoi? It might be as simple as uh, previously the government domain decided they will meet once a month to pray before service. And that was a very small commitment, but they did it. But it could be something uh, maybe bigger than that. So that's what we will do after the service uh, during our fellowship time. But I want to share a testimony about my dad. Uh, so uh, maybe now you come to know my family a little bit more with me telling stories. But my dad, uh, my dad and his uh, father, my grandfather, uh, worked uh, in a company that did uh, contract work out in the fields. So they would dig canals, they would put in drain pipes, they would clean out the canals. So Holland is known for its canals, but they all uh, grow with all kinds of, uh, uh, what do you call them? You know, algae. Algae, yeah, and there are lots of other words for the kind of gooey stuff. And so they would clean those by hand, not with machinery. And so for 40 years he worked uh, uh, with my, well, he didn't for 40 years with my grandfather, but after my grandfather passed away, he inherited a company. Uh, but his body had been worn out from all that hard labor, but he was not yet at retirement age. And so, so my dad and my mom were like, what are we going to do now? He had to close the business and they still needed to work. But my dad, because of, uh, Actually, the business went bankrupt. He went into a depression, met Christ during that season, and actually, even though he was brought up in a Reformed church, really became Christian with a relationship with God because of it. 
then now submitting everything to God, and lo and behold, my parents, this is funny, I was just telling Linda this morning, think of it, my parents were national hires for an expatriate company taking care of the grounds in the cafeteria. You know, so they were just like, oh, that's funny. They worked for an expat company. But my dad became an office worker after 40 years working in the dirt. During that time that he worked at this company, uh, my older brother uh, fought cancer and lost the battle and went to be with Jesus, very tough time. But the way my parents journeyed through that became a real testimony to the people in that company. And then when years later, my dad went through a similar battle with cancer, and I ended up eight years ago this week, uh, traveling to Holland and uh, preaching at the funeral service, I learned that his boss, uh, American, became a Christian because how my dad lived out his faith. Now my grandfather was an orphan during World War I, and he didn't know how to talk. And so my dad grew up with a silent father. And my, me and my brothers grew up with a silent father. He didn't know how to talk. My dad didn't use a lot of words, but he's shown his life right now. God had healed him years before of the pain he had. Just two years before he passed away, he couldn't come up the stairs but crawl on the hands and knees. And God, just like that, healed him, grew his leg, got rid of the pain, and here's the picture of him climbing the Rocky Mountains in Canada. And so, but his life was a testimony. He shone his light brightly in that company so that his boss, I learned at the funeral, became Christian. And this is what we do every day. It's not so much about the words that you speak to people, although words are great. But they are watching. They are watching how you behave. And particularly when life gets tough. How can they see your life shine? Every day. Let us pray. Father, we we just thank you for this opportunity that we have as a church jointly together, a community on mission here in this city, to disciple people from so many nations, but also this opportunity to to disciple a nation. Wow, this is big, this is far greater than what we could do. But together, maybe with all the churches here in the city, we can have some kind of an impact. And yes, we can go out and clean, and yes, we can donate blood, and, and we can do all kinds of things, but really it comes down to our daily life, shining our light to the people around us. And so I pray, Lord, as we launch this, this new program year, Lord, for 2017-18, that you would just reignite once again this love that you have for our city. Lord, that even on days when we're frustrated, we remember God loves Hanoi. Love Him. Let us love Him. Let us shine our light. Let us be true to our words. Let us walk our talk. Let us practice Christ like living. That people may see Jesus in us and that many will come to know Him through us. We pray in Jesus' name.